This podcast is brought to you by the IIEA, sharing ideas, shaping policy. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alex White. I'm Director General here at the Institute of International European Affairs. Um, we're very pleased to be joined uh, this afternoon uh, by a very distinguished speaker, Dr. Jeremy Zettelmar, who's Director of Bruegel, uh, which, as you know, is the Brussels-based economics think tank. Um, I suppose the European Union has been placing much greater weight recently on economic security as a distinct uh, policy objective. And at least I want to ask how, you know, does this differ from past attempts to increase resilience and prevent crises? And that there's a view that enhancing economic security should take the form of de-risking, which is a word we've heard a lot about. Um, de-risking in a way that preserves trade integrations uh, as much as possible. But how do we determine exactly what needs de-risking? Um, these are some of the issues that our guest will seek to answer, and through those answers, uh, make, make an assessment of the EU's policy agenda on economic security. What has been achieved? Are there any blind spots? How can the risk of unintended consequences be minimized? As one of the world's leading think tanks, Bruegel makes an outstanding contribution to public debate and expertise through the production of timely and incisive research on a range of international economic issues. And we're very conscious of that here at the IIEA, the work that Bruegel uh, does. So it's a great pleasure for us to have Jeremy here this afternoon to speak to us and to share some of his analysis. Uh, Jeremy will speak to us for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll have a Q&A. If you have a question, the usual drill applies. Feel free to submit the question when it occurs to you uh, using the Zoom uh, Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And a reminder that the presentation and the Q&A today are both uh, on the record. Jeremy Zettelmar has been Director of Bruegel since September uh, 2022. Born in Madrid in 1964, he was previously a Deputy Director of the Strategy and Policy Review Department of the International Monetary Fund. Prior to that, he was Dennis Weatherstone Senior Fellow and a Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. He was Director General for Economic Policy at the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. He was Director of Research and Deputy Chief Economist at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and an IMF staff member where he worked in the Research Western Hemisphere and European two departments. That's quite an impressive uh, string. He didn't, you will appreciate, do all of those things at the same time, but he did them at different periods of his stellar career. So as I have said, we are delighted to have you with us this afternoon, Jeremy, and I'm going to hand the floor to you and invite you to address us for about 20 minutes or so, after which we will continue the conversation through the Q&A. Thank you very much. Great, Alex, thank you. Uh, so much for this uh, exceedingly uh, generous introduction and, and for inviting me to speak at IIEA. Uh, so I will uh, try to, to share my screen. <clears throat> All right, so, so this is uh, based on work uh, I've been doing with a group of people, um, uh, which will be coming out in a, in a report in early May. And so I'm, I'm sort of jumping the gun a little bit and I'm nervous that my co-authors will accuse me of having done that before the official launch. So I'm, I'm keeping things sort of quite quite general, but we we can we can go into the details uh, later. And and so the, basically the background for this uh, report, which we will launch on May sixth and seventh, is that uh, we, uh, you know, as economists, we thought we we should uh, have a sort of clearer, more data-based view on where our economic security risks actually come from. Um, and it, I mean, the, it worked to some extent, at least in the sense that the results of this project, which consists of five papers, I will show you in a second, made me change my mind a little bit on the on the topic. And and so I, I will tell you why. So the, the plan for the for the next 20 minutes is it's very simple. Uh, I will give you our take on what economic security means. Uh, it's a term that we did not use very much uh, until about a year ago or maybe two years ago. 
but of course there are many related terms national security uh you know crisis prevention and mitigation and so the question is what what is special about this term and and about its context i will give you sort of my main personal <clears throat> takeaways from this forthcoming body of work and then i will draw some implications for the eu uh, policy agenda so on the first question you know what, what does it mean what what is different about economic security relative to uh, related con concepts so so the way I would define it is as uh, security from external economic threats. Uh, and so there are two neighboring concepts, national security and a crisis prevention and mitigation. How does it differ from national security? Uh, I would say in the sense that it excludes the military and other non-economic threats. Um, but it, it does um, also include a category of um, uh, you know, problems, threats that are typically not included under national security, which I would say sort of non-willful threats. So what economists would refer to as, as shocks. So there is a little bit outside the concept that's inside national security. There's something inside this concept that is not covered usually by national security, but there is quite a big overlap. And the overlap, I would say, consists of willful economic harm inflicted by foreign actors, right? So that is common to both economic and national security. Uh, now, how does it differ from what we as economists are more, more used to? So, you know, in a sense, when I first heard the term and as something new, I thought, what do you mean? I mean, we have been worrying about, you know, how to prevent bad stuff in the economy for, forever. Uh, but, but typically, uh, when we do that, we really focus on either crises that are generated in domestic economic systems, in, in the sense that they are our fault, uh, for example, a mortgage crisis, or we, uh, to the extent that we focus on external uh, problems, these are external shocks that are not necessarily a reflection of willful uh, actors. And so the, the little diagram here is supposed to kind of clarify these concepts. So you, you have national security risks that are defined, as I understand them, by deliberate action, um, and they are to the right of, of this box, and they could uh, include any method of propagation, so through trade investment, financial disease, military, or, or other, all kinds of channels uh, through which you may suffer harm. Uh, and then we have the more traditional realm of economists, economic crises, which focus on just two uh, channels of propagation, uh, trade investment and financial uh, channels, and they typically do encompass both domestic origins of crisis and external origins, but they tend not to focus on, on deliberate action, right? Deliberate action is the notional, national security realm. And so what, what this concept of external security does is straddle uh, these two uh, concepts. Now, the, the way it's being applied in practice uh, these days focuses mostly on trade-related threats, but I think that is not intrinsic to the definition. And in fact, I will argue that it's a problem that we are currently virtually only focusing on, on trade-related threats. So that brings me to the question of what, what threats we are talking about specifically. So if you, you know, this is simply an observation of what is on policymakers' mind, particularly in, in the post-COVID uh, period. So, so the first category is, was really defined by COVID. So this was this experience that something happening very far away in a major trading partner, in this case, China, it could really have enormous uh, economic consequences for the rest of the world, uh, not just through the direct effects. So that was, of course, the pandemic itself, but because of trade implications. Uh, and uh, the, the reason for that were the port closures uh, in China, the disruptions of supply chains, and because of our high level of integration and because supply chains magnify a shock that occurs upstream. So you can have a relatively small shock upstream that wouldn't be much damage if the supply chain ended. But if it's far upstream and these chains are long, it can reach to the far corners of, of the world. So we, we are still concerned about that. And I think that is still part of the concept of economic security. Now, the, the second sort of class of threats that we have become aware of and, and concerned with increasingly. And so this had to do with 
uh, Chinese coercion vis-a-vis -vis Lithuania uh, for political reasons uh, because of Taiwan and uh, similarly uh, uh, coercion vis-a-vis -vis Australia. Uh, but prior to that, similar coercion had happened vis-a-vis -vis Japan. So in the case of Japan, uh, China decided to stop exporting uh, some critical raw materials to Japan. In the case of Australia, it banned imports uh, of wine or de facto banned them. Uh, these things are sometimes done in, in sort of indirect ways and, and raw materials uh, as well. Uh, you, you can also arguably count the Trump Section 232 tariffs. So these were the aluminum and steel tariffs inflicted on several U.S. allies as, as part of this uh, coercive approach. And then, of course, the best known, most traditional form of, of threats are just economic and financial sanctions, which are kind of an order of magnitude uh, bigger than what is in class two, because it's not supposed to just, uh, you know, be a, a limited publish, punishment for a, for a particular uh, political action, but it's supposed to hurt your adversary in a, in a more com comprehensive way, such as a sanction that we impose on, on Russia. Okay, now, one important question is, uh, you know, fine, we, we may be in a world that uh, has to deal with such types of threats to a greater extent than, uh, than in the past, but does this really require policy intervention? So, you know, firms have every, every incentive to protect themselves. Uh, so do we need to do anything uh, beyond, in a, in a sense, making firms aware, uh, having them read the newspaper, essentially? And so there's sort of broad agreement among economists that the answer is, is yes. And that has to do mostly with three effects. The first is this so-called network externality. So firms, again, this relates to the role of supply chains. They're a part of a network. It's a broader effect, though. They're part of a network uh, of relationships. And, you know, within this network, the relationships between the partners, between the firms that trade with each other and, 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 and supply each other and their customers are not always, uh, you know, market relations that are revised on an ongoing uh, basis. And so, you know, if you, uh, if you have a problem, uh, it's not just going to affect you, it's also going to affect the, the firms that depend on you. And this is not automatically reflected in, in market prices. And so there is an externality uh, and you may not, you know, sufficiently consider the fact that if there's a problem that you suffer, a whole slew of others will also suffer that problem. Uh, the, the second argument is that firms do, don't have full information about the risk exposures. So this is an issue, uh, particularly with long or complex supply chains. And finally, there's a moral hazard argument, which is that firms might hope to get rescued by the state if things get really bad. And so... As a result of these three effects, there's probably a generic case for uh, policies focused on de-risking. Now, the big problem, of course, is what and how to de-risk. And the main reason why this is a problem uh, is that we, we cannot just throw sort of the, the kitchen sink at, at the problem because de-risking may be costly. And, you know, first and foremost, uh, it is costly because what we would call trade dependencies, so that we are you know, specialized in the world economy. And as a result, you know, we purchase specific goods from places like China. It, this is reflection of specialization, right? So this is, in a sense, a phenomenon that we have embraced as societies since the early 19th century, uh, at, at the very least. And, and the reason for that is that we can jointly produce more if we specialize on things that we are good at. And so uh, this is what people talk about when they refer to the gains from trade. So in some sense, dependency is very intimately, very directly related with the gains from trade. If we want to cut down on dependencies, we might cut down on gains from trade and, and it might hurt us more than it helps. Um, the other reason why de-risking could be costly has to do with the fact that I have focused on external uh, risks, uh, but there is of course still domestic risks and reducing trade integration while it may make us safer with respect to imported problems, it makes us less safe with respect to our ability to deal with domestic problems. <clears throat> a third and extremely important point is that aggressive trade risking, of course, has political consequences, right? So we, we are taking a hostile approach towards a trading partner that could damage international cooperation. 
uh, particularly in areas like climate change where we really need it. And fourth and finally, you know, it's the perennial problem if we are talking about the EU that we are, you know, broadly aligned, but not exactly aligned in our interests within the EU. And so aggressive de-risking might hurt some countries in the EU more than others. So for example, you know, aggressively reducing export exposures is going to hurt Germany more than Spain vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, China. And, and so it could threaten cohesion within the EU, which in turn makes threats harder to deter because divisions can be exploited. So how do you sort of deal with these trade-offs? And, and so there is a conventional view uh, that the right way of dealing with these trade-offs is this, uh, to, to quote um, Jake Sullivan, the U.S. National Security Advisor in a speech, I think last year at the, at the Brookings Institution, is the, the small yard, high fence approach, which is try and identify a few critical trade dependencies, uh, ideally at the product level, and then reduce these trade dependencies, mainly by diversification. So by not by necessarily trading less, but by trading less with the specific partner that you are in this good, in this good category, dependent on and trading more with others. And then otherwise you maintain maximum integration, including with that trading partner that might potentially harm you because the channels through which you can be harmed have been reduced. And, and so basically what I have, I have changed my mind a little bit on this prescription. Uh, so I'm, I'm still an economic liberal. I'm still in favor of trade, but I think putting it like this is just a bit too simple. And so I'm, I have three more slides. I will, and then I'll, I will tell you why, why it's uh, too, uh, too simple. So it has to do with the sort of two main insights of this uh, research report, which includes uh, five papers by a bunch of uh, of economists and sort of applied economists, including, I'm very proud to say, three Irish people, uh, Morgan Kelly, Kevin O'Rourke, and Conor Mc McCaffrey, who is actually at at uh, Bruegel, and he was at some uh, stage in his life, uh, at least an intern or something like that at IIEA. So he, he was all happy when he heard that I was going to uh, present there. Okay, so, so the two insights are the following. The first one is that, you know, this idea that let's just focus on these pressure points, let's identify the product level trade dependencies and reduce them, it's really, really hard to implement. And the reason is that while it is possible to identify goods where we import a lot relative to what we produce domestically in the EU, and among these goods, it's easy to pick goods that have a very concentrated import porter structure, say goods where we are, you know, importing 90% from India or 98% from China. So that, that stuff is easy to do. What is much harder to do is to capture indirect dependencies, which tends to, in, in a way, uh, 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 which implies that that the, the first two steps may understate the problem, right? Because we, we might uh, depend, we might be exposed to China, not just directly, but because we are exposed to a country that imports a lot from China. But, but more importantly, even more importantly, what it, it completely misses this approach is what might actually happen uh, if there's a disruption in imports. So how easy would it be to substitute away from a specific importer, right? And this, this can have a very big effect. So in, in the end, we got through the energy crisis of 2022 better than we thought, particularly Germany got through it better uh, than it thought, because uh, it was possible to substitute away from Russian gas somewhat more easily than people had had thought. Um, and then the, the really important thing that this approach misses is that it doesn't really give you any, a sense of the economic costs of disruption in the event that, you know, all things go bad and we really cannot substitute away from an import source. So we might not be able to substitute away from, from a specific importer, but we could still substitute away, say, from the goods that we are importing on the uh, on the consumption side. Uh, and so, you know, one of the chapters in this report, there's a list of, you know, of our top 20 or so trade dependencies. And it turns out that about half of them are consumer goods, something like, you know, camping equipment, electric blankets, artificial flowers, right? So, so those are our sort of big trade dependencies. They're not the only ones, of course. So there are some more serious ones, but uh, these type of, of selecting dependencies doesn't really give you a sense of that. And it's extremely difficult to actually establish a sense of that. And so the consequence is, if, is that if you're going down this road, you will get both lots of missed 
dependencies because you sort of fail to count some of these indirect dependencies, but you may also get lots of false positives. So you may get some goods that you look, it looks like you're very dependent. And in fact, you are currently are in the sense that you import a lot from just one trading partner, but then it will be very easy either to find another trading partner uh, once prices go up or to substitute away from this good uh, entirely. Okay, the, the second big insight from this paper is that the, the costs of a hard stop to trade with a highly integrated partner, or to put it more bluntly, the, the cost of a decoupling, a complete decoupling from China, are an order of magnitude higher than the cost of a gradual reduction in integration, even if it leads to complete decoupling. So essentially, the time frame of decoupling matters almost as much as the extent. And this is a, a point that has been often overlooked. <clears throat> so the just to give you the orders of magnitude, the output cost of a hard stop in trade between the G7 and the EU on the one hand and China and Russia on the other as a result of a geopolitical shock like an invasion of Taiwan. So imagine a, a sanction scenario, right? Where we really stop trading in most categories. The output costs of this event for a place like Germany, which is quite dependent on China, is large. It's not, it wouldn't kill Germany. So according to this uh, paper, uh, it's somewhere in the order of magnitude of the COVID recession. So four, 5% of GDP. But if you decouple gradually over time, and have a time to substitute away to other trading partners, that cost, according to these authors, is going to drop to something like 1% of GDP. For the US, 0.5% of GDP. Um, and so why, why is this? So what, I mean, this, this is, was a bit surprising to me because I, for a very long time, believed that you know, the, the option of simply going back to a Cold War type uh, situation uh, where we uh, stop trading with a large hostile uh, block wasn't really there because uh, China is so much more important to the world economy than the Soviet Union was. Well, according to this trade model, that's, you know, it may be true, it is costly, but it's not really unbearably costly. And, and the result, what's generating this result is that even it is assumed here that the decoupling happens between, if you like, China and the West, but both blocks continue trading with the rest of the world and, of course, with each other. And so it turns out that there are sufficient gains from trade to realize most, uh, or, or there's sufficient, sufficient diversity in what these blocks produce, right? Diversity and comparative advantage. In, in the rest of the world to mean that in the end, the in the long run, the gains uh, from trade uh, uh, in, in trading with, with China or, or rather the, the losses uh, from a decoupling are not uh, not so uh, so big as, as we thought. Okay, so what, what does one take away from this? This is my second to last slide. So first of all, I, it's still think, I think it's still a good idea to, to worry of on de-risking of products, but I, I think what should focus sort of on products where the costs of interruptions are just unquestionably large, right? So we are very unlikely to get false positives, if you like. So this is the things like natural gas, computer chips, or critical medical supplies. In many cases, we don't know how big the costs are, but when we do know that the costs are very big, then by all means, we should diversify. Now, in my view, this in excludes a product category like solar panels, you know, which sort of are often mentioned as somehow strategic and important for the Green Deal and so forth, but they're not in the category where the cost of interruption are unquestionably large because all that would happen uh, if the Chinese uh, uh, stopped sending us solar panels is that we couldn't, we would have to continue the green transition at a somewhat higher cost, right? But, but the energy supply doesn't go down just because they're not sending us new solar panels. The, the second point that follows from this literature is that, you know, maybe this overwhelming focus on import dependency, which has to do with, you know, our Russia and COVID traumas, 
is really a bit misplaced in, in the sense that export dependency is, is just as important. So what, what is driving sort of the economic cost of the decoupling with China is to a very large extent the fact that we export a lot to China, not just our import uh, dependency. And, and by the same logic, we should also not forget that there are other forms of dependency, financial uh, and so forth. They may not be relevant with respect to China, but in some scenarios of the world, they could be relevant with respect to other countries, you know, God forbid, this may include the United States. The, the third, and for me, the most important insight is that raising resilience is at least as important as de-risking. And, and that has to do with this, you know, basic humility that we are not going to be sure whether we really can get the de-risking right. We don't know, and we will likely never know enough to protect ourselves against the most relevant threats. And so we have to protect ourselves against what Donald Rumsfeld used to call the unknown unknowns. And that's another reason to strengthen the single market. So to be able to react flexibly within the EU. For the same reason, because we're not really sure that we will be able to uh, uh, mount uh, sort of the right defense, having identified or de-risked the right products before, we need to worry about deterrence, not just de-risking. So uh, deterrence is in a sense, the economic security or the national uh, security version of crisis prevention. Uh, so if you are able to deter coercion, uh, that's that's as good uh, a defense as, as de-risking. And then finally, there's sort of this really hard question, which I'm not sure I know the answer to is, should we, given how China has evolved, reduce overall integration with China? And so this is essentially a question of probability. So to give you the orders of magnitude, you know, for, from a German perspective, the, the cost of a hard decoupling from China is 4% of GDP. Um, and the cost of, you know, a partial preemptive decoupling might be 0.4% of GDP. And so are these 0.4% of GDP justifiable as a sort of insurance premium to prepare yourself for the fact that trade might just stop? Well, it probably depends on the probability that trade would just stop, right? And so that is a, a calculus uh, that is uh, beyond what I, I can do. Okay, final slide. How has the EU actually done on these fronts? So you, there is a plethora of legislation that the EU has done, mostly in the von der Leyen uh, presidency, a little uh, before that uh, too. Uh, and so I'm happy to, to uh, talk about some of these things later, but, but roughly what it uh, boils down to is, is the following. And I'm ordering this now in the same categories as the previous slide. So I'm going through these main insights from, from our report. So on import de-risking, I, I think the, the commission has done fine in the sense that they have put a lot of weight on this subject, but with some caveats. And so there are essentially two caveats. The, the right thing is, the, the thing that's good about it is that they have focused on some of these critical things, I mean, critical raw materials and computer chips. Um, they've also focused on clean tech, which uh, I think should not be subsumed in as much in the economic security uh, umbrella. There may be sort of competitiveness reasons where we may want to push clean tech, but basically the, you know, in EU ha has tried to push what at the beginning sounded a little bit of a protectionist agenda on clean tech under this umbrella of economic security, and I don't think it belongs there. Uh, and then the other thing you can uh, complain about is that the policy instruments are often weak. Now, that's not necessarily the, the commission's fault, right? They are mostly weak because we don't have much money uh, at the EU level. Uh, what has been almost entirely ignored is export dependency and financial dependency. So the, the focus is completely driven by this, you know, the COVID Russia trauma. It's all about what if certain imports stop. So the idea that we might hurt ourselves because we just export too much to China hasn't had nearly as much of a, a debate, a discussion as the import dependency question. Similarly, the, the point that, you know, the, the resilience agenda should have received another kick after Russia and in, in light of a more authoritarian China, and it, it really hasn't. So remember the term resilience, it was all on vogue after COVID. It's been forgotten a little bit and replaced by economic security. But once you think it through, you sort of discover that at the end, the best you can do is probably to raise resilience uh, after all. And uh, fortunately, this 
uh, this uh, idea is brought out in the Enri um, Enrico Letta's uh, report on the single market, which was published uh, yesterday. Now, the, the one area where the commission gets the highest marks, I think, where they really have done very well, is on deterrence. So there's a thing called an anti-coercion instrument, which is basically a legal instrument that allows the commission, with the agreement of, of the council, so the, the council has to has to be in favor, and maybe what you can what you could argue is that it would be nice to have a qualified majority voting against this um, uh, to um, give the commission more leeway. But the, the commission can, uh, if it detects coercion, essentially retaliate in any way it wants against the entities, you know, firms of the country that is coercing us uh, to the point of, you know, prohibiting them uh, to sell inside the EU. Uh, and then there's the really difficult uh, question on whether we should reduce integration with China. And I think that should at least have a discussion in the EU. Um, it, this is something that would be comparatively easy to do with respect to policy instruments. So unlike import protection, which requires you to do things in general that are WTO illegal, which we do not want to do because we still want to defend open rules-based trade, you can very, very easily reduce export dependence to exports tariffs that is completely legal under the WTO or diversification charges or stuff like that. I don't think anyone is talking about that. And indeed, it could have unintended side effects. It could make our relationship with China much more difficult. And of course, the reason, the main reason why no one is talking about that is that the political economy is, is really deadly, right? So you have German exporters, which are already in trouble because of high energy costs. And you tell them on top of that, you can't export as much to the one country that's still profitable, uh, you're going to get a lot of pushback. So I, I don't think this is a very realistic option, maybe not a desirable option, but one has to think through it and then possibly consider an alternative, which is to take a prudential approach to company or sector exposure, especially telling companies, look, you know, feel free to export as much as you want, but be aware, have a contingency plan in case uh, there is a problem. And finally, uh, I will just end with this. I don't have time to get into it, but we could do it in the discussion. The elephant in the room, of course, is is Trump. Uh, so, you know, if Trump gets reelected, Nazi things uh, could happen to the EU. Um, and that uh, opens yet, yet another dimension of economic security that we can, we can talk about. So let me stop here. And uh, sorry for going a little over that allocated time. This podcast is brought to you by the IIEA. Sharing ideas shaping policy.